Good afternoon. Welcome to our first um, NIST event celebrating World Metrology Day 2015. This year, in addition to celebrating the role of metrology in our lives, we are also celebrating the United Nations Declaration of 2015 being the International Year of Light. The UN Declaration seeks to raise the awareness of the role of light-based technologies in promoting sustainable development and providing solutions to many of other societal problems. So uh, for the first event today, we're going to start by hearing Professor Alan Wilner's thoughts on optics and photonics for our world. Um, but after Alan's talk, there's more. Um, I'd like to invite you to review the many posters that are now in the hallway next to us uh, from NIST staff highlighting how they use light in, in their metrology efforts here at NIST. And then there will also be guided tours, um, which you can sign up for during the poster session. And Heather is the person to seek out, I think there are, what, nine different tours? Um, with three different stops in each tour. And, uh, um, so um, I think they're going to start those after people have had some time to look at the, at the posters that are up. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Alan. Professor Wilner received his PhD from Columbia University in 1988. Um, he had to work under a friend of mine, Rick Osgood. Um, and Rick Osgood's had several interactions with NIST since I've been here. Um, Alan also worked at at t Bell Labs and at Bellcore. He joined the University of Southern California in 1992, where he is currently the Stephen and Catherine Sample Chaired Professor in Engineering. He's received numerous recognitions, including an NSF National Young Investigator Award, an NSF Presidential Faculty Fellows Award, he was a, a Packard Foundation Fellowship, a Fulbright Foundation Senior Sc Scholar Award, IEEE Lasers and Electronics Distinguished Traveling Lecture Award, and an honorary doctorate from the Yeshiva University. Uh, he is an IEEE Fellow and a Fellow of the Optical Society of America. Alan has more than 1,000 publications. 24 of those are patents, um, and his research in optical communications, signal processing, and networks. Alan also received, also served as the president of the IEEE Photonic Society. He was the co-chair of the US National Academy's study on optics and photonics. He is also president-elect of the Optical Society of America, and he will serve as the president of the Optical Society of America in 2016 during their 100th year anniversary. So you're going to have your work cut out for you. Um, Alan's not only a distinguished researcher in optics and photonics, but he's also has provided significant service to the scientific community. I'll quote from the Optical Society of America CEO Elizabeth Ro Rogan, who states, Alan's approach to service in the optics and photonics community is one of inclusion and cooperation with a capacity to find consensus on the most critical of issues. So with that, let's welcome Alan Wilner. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. This is, I, I spoke here, um, this was uh, about 18 years ago. There was a conference here on uh, wavelength division multiplexing, WDM. Uh, and I was in this room, so I chaired a session and I, told, I said to the person, you have two, you know, I held up two fingers, two minutes left. And the, and the guy said, I, I have four minutes. He pointed to the clock and I said, ah, the clock's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but, and also, uh, actually, so Alan, so my, my, I grew up in Baltimore County. And so my father, who's not an engineer, um, my father passed away about 15 years ago. He, uh, he came to hear me. So he was sitting right around there and he was listening to all these things. And when, at that time, 18 years ago, I was asked to introduce myself. So I start off by saying, you know, I don't know what to say about myself. Maybe my father can introduce me. <laughs> anyway. So this, I have to say, this is one of the toughest talks I've had to put together because, it, you know, it's, it, optics and photonics is, it's like, a, it's, it's not just one field, it's, it's multiple fields. So what I'm going to try to do is go through basically a story. It's, and it's really, it's a, it's a party this year, not only because of the International Year of Light. Uh, there's lots of things going on. 
So I'll try to spend maybe the first 20 minutes or so talking about what's been going on in the community non-technically and then move into some technical areas and, and, and try to give you a flavor of, of what some of my thoughts on it. Although, no matter what I talk about, there's going to be a good fraction of you who know more about it than I do. So, um, I certainly want to thank very much uh, Howard Yoon uh, and Marla Dow for the invitation, Stephanie for uh, uh, helping with the logistics, and Cameron, uh, who also very much is hospitality today. Uh, I had several people who helped uh, with uh, slides for the presentation, Eugene Arthurs, Tom Baer, John Dudley, Tom Hauskin, Laura Colton, Krasinda uh, Plankovich, and my wonderful, wonderful students. Uh, and I've been fortunate to be funded by uh, lots of different places and collaborate with those places as well. Okay, so it's been a party. The party, 2015 is the International Year of Light. And the point is to raise awareness. You know, a lot of, we all know this, you know, somebody comes along with an idea and, and you just look at the person and you say, you know, don't spin your wheels, nothing's going to come of it. And John Dudley, who uh, is the ch basically the chair of the uh, International Year of Light Committee, which was uh, blessed by uh, UNESCO, uh, he, he was going around several years ago trying to get, it, get interest. And a lot of people weren't paying too much attention. But he kept on persevering and sure enough, it came to fruition. Um, it, the early patrons, he got people, uh, this is uh, Prince Andrew uh, in the UK, uh, this is Princess Sumaya Beit El Hassan in Jordan. He had people from all around the world at the highest levels saying, you know, yes, let's celebrate the Year of Light. Uh, the kickoff was really January 1st, so when you think about the world, I, I think New Zealand comes first, but Australia, there's nothing like the, the Opera House. But they had, a, a, a January 1st, they, they had a, a, a nice neon uh, LED uh, um, uh, logo for the International Year of Light to kick things off. And it's been a party around the world. So there's been events, there was the kickoff in Paris in, uh, in January, uh, air, things in, uh, in India and in Australia, all around the world. It's been actually wonderful. Um, the, the, if anybody was there in Paris, it, it was really like a party. There was a lot of people who were technical, a lot of non-technical people, people who cared about photosynthesis uh, and uh, you know, just light, lighting the world in, in, in far-flung places. So at the end, uh, so Einstein had a, uh, he had a violin, a Stradivarius, and so Joshua Bell uh, played Einstein's Stradivarius at the end, at the end of the, uh, the first day. It was really like a party. So I don't know if any, Joshua Bell, anybody recognize him? Okay, so for those of you who know him, so very well known, uh, I took a picture with him and I, I went over to him, I said, I, I thought you only did subways. <laughs> Which got a very, a smirk out of him. But anyway, go, go, you can Google him. <laughs> Anyway, and, and Bill Phillips was there, so he was on stage. It was really like a party, because uh, people were talking about art, optics and art, optics and religion, optics and everything. So here, here was Bill, of course, on stage. And one of the things, uh, the, uh, Saudi Arabia put up a lot of the, the money for uh, the celebration. And one of the things they wanted to do was have, uh, have people recognize that one of the first optical scientists was someone called Ibn al-Haytham. And I had never heard of Ibn al-Haytham before. I'm, I was very embarrassed. Uh, so he, had, he wrote seven, a seven-volume treatise on optics. And so I go over to the, to the delegate and I say, you know, I've worked in this field for 30 years. I can't believe I'm embarrassed to say I've never heard of. And so I went back and of course I tried to learn. And I have a, a few students from Saudi Arabia, so I went over to them and I, you know, it's, it's I grew up in, in uh, New York in, in the 60s. The, you know, the, the textbooks I had in history were very European centric. So I, 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 I joke with my Chinese students that I was taught that uh, Marco Polo discovered China. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, there were, there were people before uh, Newton and so on. Now, there were many anniversaries, that, again, you, you, you can cherry pick, but there were many anniversaries. Uh, it was the thousand year anniversary of Al Haytham's book, uh, and then various other, other uh, uh, anniversaries to uh, the, 15, the year 15, Fresnel, Maxwell, uh, and so on. Really, it's a lot of fun. Now, 
the, the awareness is being raised. I think many people in the community, I, I, you know, the laser, of course, is one of those giant inventions of the, uh, of the 20th century. Um, and we were all sad, of course, when Charlie Towns passed away, but he made it into the year of light before passing away. So this is actually, um, uh, so my advisor, uh, Professor Osgood. So I'm actually part of Charlie Towns' academic tree. So one of his first students was Ali Javan, and one of his first students was Richard Osgood. I'm a, a student of uh, Professor Osgood, and I have a student. Uh, he's a professor in Melbourne. He has a student. She's at the, in Eindhoven. She has a student. Uh, he's a professor in Malaysia. So it, this is an amazing tree that, that existed. And again, it's, uh, it's a shame. Uh, but Charlie really lived a glorious life. Um, but, you know, people like to say that the, the laser was an invention, uh, was, was, a, was an invention waiting for an application. But this is from, this is from uh, Shallow Towns. Uh, this is a patent uh, for the patent on the maser. But figure one in the patent talks about a communication system where you generate, of course, the, um, you, you generate a, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the wave, you modulate it, you detect it. So this idea of using light or microwaves for communications was clearly there way at the beginning. And it goes to Charlie's genius as well. So the other thing that happened a couple of, uh, about two, three years ago, well, it goes back several years, uh, was the release of the uh, National Academy's report, uh, Optics and Photonics, Essential Technologies for Our Nation. One of the, the keys was that, many of you may remember, in 1998, there was the Harnessing Light study. And what, that was a wonderful study, but it, it's not clear how much impact it had afterwards. And so the, the goal this time was to try to use it and impact the community and to try to bring more attention to our field. Problem is, is of course, we enable almost everything, right? So optics and photonics is almost everywhere, but people don't realize it. So uh, NIST was one of the sponsors. I had, uh, when we were getting ready uh, to try to get this thing kicked off, I literally went around hat in hand and tried to beg for money because the National Academies, until, unless they got to 72% of the funding, they wouldn't start the study. So I was going around and NIST was one of the funders here. And I will say, again, for those, this, was in the, this was in the fall of 2010. So in the fall of 2010, before the word sequestration came up, there was a government shutdown. And before the government shut down, in which case it would have been impossible to squeeze out any money, um, my hero uh, stepped up. So Kent, Kent Rochford, Kent stepped up and he lit his contribution, uh, he spirited the contribution out of NIST. It put us over, it literally, weeks, days before the government closed, we, we got over the, the, uh, the threshold and the academies uh, started the study. So, uh, what, gotta love him, okay. <laughs> now, the study was, you know, it's just amazing. You think about 1998 to 2012, orders of magnitude, I don't have to tell you guys, <laughs> orders of magnitude of improvements in technology. And so, it literally, it was begging to be looked at again. Uh, but the problem is, is it was everywhere. It was enabling everything. So how do you choose, you know, how, what do you do with the study? And so the, the hope was uh, that it would provide some insight to help decision makers, whoever those decision makers may be, in government, in companies, in industry, help the decision makers to have a compelling argument to strategically plan optics. So the, the I, people do that with Moore's Law, right? They plan it, there's a roadmap. Optics and photonics doesn't have a roadmap, or at least not one that is recognized and universally accepted. But we, optics and photonics has enabled orders of magnitude improvements just like Moore's Law. But Moore's Law, you know, they, they're, every, they're belly aching. The electronics people belly ache, you know, oh, we're coming to the end of Moore's Law. We, got, we, need, we need help, we need help, and I can't violate the laws of physics, Captain, whatever it is, okay? So, <laughs> But optics and photonics, we have the same thing, right? We have the same problem, we have problems. This is um, the study, and uh, two of the uh, chapters in the study was uh, advanced manufacturing and advanced uh, photonic measurements and applications. Clearly, 
uh, NIST, the issues related to NIST interest was, uh, was key. Now, Bob Beyer of uh, Stanford, and he's uh, former president of APS and OSA and I, IEEE Photonic Society. So when we started the study, and Bob was on the previous study, he held up his iPhone and he said, this is our problem. This is the problem we have in the community, in society. He says, nobody understands in society that the iPhone is enabled by optics. Right? So if you, if you have your iPhone, you, first of, all, of course, you have your camera, you have a screen, that's optics. The chip inside is made with optical, optical lithography, couldn't be done without it. Then if you were to do a Google search, it would have to go, even though it's wireless, it has to go into the ground through the fiber optic communication system, and then it goes into a data center. So that data center, which didn't exist in 1998, we heard from Google that their big data centers could have as many as a million lasers. Because if you have a, 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 a you want to connect up your servers with high bandwidth. And so if you have a fiber, whether it's a meter or a hundred meters, once it's in optics, it doesn't even matter. It just travels at the speed of light with no, practically no loss. If it's less than a kilometer, there's, there's, it's, it, you can't, who cares? So this idea that optics and photo, you could not have the internet as we have it today. You could not have a data center as we have it today without optics. In fact, I think the Museum of London, when they asked, when they did, uh, they had a survey of what the, the top 10 things people couldn't live without. Uh, number one was sunlight, and number two was the internet. And both are optics. <laughs> right? So uh, this is from Tom Baer put this together, and this was shown at OSTP, uh, but essentially to show that you know, maybe you know, the, the optics is the inner, the, the actual optical hardware is inside here, but it enables so much of, the, so much of, of what we have. Uh, I used to, when I first started in the field, the, the CD players, right, the DVD players, CD players, there was a little laser in a, C, a CD player. So, you know, maybe it cost a dollar or less, but you couldn't have a CD player without it, even though if the CD player was $50. Right? So it, it literally is the key component to so much of our society. There are many grand challenges that the study came up with. The, I, I wanted to highlight some of them for, for this audience is develop optical sources and imaging tools to support an order of magnitude increased resolution in manufacturing, especially, say, 3D printing, which I'll get to later. Generate light whose photonic structure has been pre-arranged to yield better performance than ordinary light. We can tailor and control light. It's what it looks like in the spatial domain, in phase, in frequency, amplitude, everything. We can, we can do whatever, we can structure the light however we want. We can control it and it opens up a whole new vista that we're just starting to scratch the surface. Again, I'll get to that a little bit later. Now, one of, the key, uh, one of the key recommendations was to form a national photonics initiative. Now, the national photonics initiative was started by the main uh, uh, society, professional societies in optics, and it's essentially to bring together academia and government and industry to have a collective voice. I'm sure many of you are aware of this, right? The, uh, so you know, there's a game uh, called whack-a-mole, right? There's a, you know, somebody pops their head up and, and they go away, right? So for decades, our community, again, we're not the semiconductor community. So what, we, what happens is, is somebody in an agency, okay, they're a champion. They're interested and they try to start a program, start, start something. But then that person goes away and the program goes away. And there isn't this overarching feeling that optics and photonics needs to go forward strategically, it is, that it's a core enabler. And unless we do something, people outside the US are going to be the ones to lead, lead the way. So that's really the idea is so that each of the agencies and also within government, outside of government, will consider optics and photonics as a strategic priority that will continue beyond an individual champion in any, in any key uh, specific area. The, the various areas we focused on originally, defense and national security, energy, healthcare, communications, and manufacturing. But you'll see in a moment, the, the, this voice 
is a big deal, right? How do we get a voice that says, this is important, the things that you're, uh, the, unless we do something strategically to plan today to invest in R&D, we won't be the leaders in this very critical technology going forward. Um, we were successful in getting optics and photonics mentioned in these uh, congressional acts, which is not, not a small deal when there aren't that many congressional acts going through. <laughs> so. When the study came out, uh, this is uh, uh, Craig Barrett. So Craig Barrett, uh, the former CEO of Intel, he was there. So Intel gets it, right? Intel is a, it's a, it's a, it's a chip company, but they get that optics and photonics is important. He was there at the rollout. Steve Chu was there. Uh, whether it's Europe or China or Japan, you pick the economy, they list optics and photonics as a key area. It's obvious that optics and photonics is an integral part of every industry of the 21st century. It's, that's really amazing. And by the way, I love that. I love that. I would follow him into battle. I'd go anywhere <laughs> with him. Now, at the, at the rollout, he said that, and this is really funny. So um, that's, uh, this, is, this is from APS News, uh, October of that year. Of course, here's Steve Chu, Bob Beyer. That's me. And that's my, I brought my son along. And they, they have it here. It says, uh, the report co-chair Wilner looks on as does a member of the next Wilner generation. OK? <laughs> And I will tell you, you know, talk about pressure. Craig Barrett, okay, so those of you, you're all familiar with this, the Intel science, science competition for high schoolers? Craig Barrett, former Intel CEO, said, looks at my son. He's 10. He says, you should apply. You should apply for the Intel science talent, talent competition. And he's, look, he's 10, right? He's like looking up. And I said, well, maybe he's a little on the young side. He said, no, no, he should really do it. Talk about pressure. <laughs> Unbelievable. Now, um, the report comes out, and again, the idea was, what do you do with the report? Well, OSTP, the, so the White House formed very fairly quickly and cited, uh, this, this was during sequestration now. They formed a fast track action committee, and they looked at the, Na the National Academy's report. They identified and wanted to form a, a, a committee to look at how to strategically plan to move forward. Right? How to not let this important field just sort of be there and depend on the kindness of strangers, so to speak. Uh, what followed from OSTP was they came out with this report, Building a Bright Future with Optics and Photonics. One of their key recommendations, and as was in the National Academy's report, was an accessible fabrication facility for researchers a prototyping facility, a, a foundry of some sort that was accessible. And as you can well imagine, this is, you can see where this is leading into the Manufacturing Institute. One of the, uh, one of the specific uh, issues was we need to prototype in order to innovate. Uh, I had a couple of uh, designs that were being made outside the US because I couldn't get anybody inside the US to make it for me. Um, this shows, this is Optics Express, a, a leading journal in the field, and it just shows that from North America, the number of authors is declining. Uh, to just take one guess where the, the authors are from here, right? So in Asia, they are very serious about this. Now, I'm going to, many, many of you know about this already, but this was October 3rd. But this is basically the science, the technology around light, which is used to transmit data and information. Everything from, from, and also is used in manufacturing process for everything from lasers to some of the stuff that the Department of Defense is doing. And, and what, these, what these hubs allow us to do is instead of having a slower process where somebody in some lab coat somewhere figures something out and then writes a report on it. And then maybe five years later, some manufacturer says, huh, I wonder if I could tinker around with that and use that in my manufacturing process. You have a, a system where the businesses and the researchers are working on it at the same time, which speeds up so this was a, 
just unbelievable. For those of us in the field to hear the president talk about this is, it was really fantastic. Um, and right now they're in the down, in the, we were so good, our community was so good at getting the word out and organizing. The, 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 the BAA originally said that our community was fragmented. I don't think that was a positive term. <laughs> and there were six topics. They said they were going to select two. Turns out they selected one, and that was photonics. And that really, so we really came together in a big way. Um, this is, by the way, this is the notional in the, B, in the BAA. This was what they were looking at. Lithography was only one issue. It was really about also design tools, having access through some broker, because there's a lot of capability, capacity out there in the United States. It's just not accessible. So getting a broker is, is a big deal. Uh, and then uh, doing test assembly and packaging. So it's meant to get things into people's hands. Right? That's, a big, that's a big deal. It's not a research project. It's really to enable innovation by everybody in the United States. So Nobel laureates in our field. You, we talked about a party, right? The International Year of Light. The National Man this Manufacturing Institute is going to come online. Um, lots of Nobel laureates. This year was the, it was the mother load for optics and photonics in, 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 the, in, in, in this area. So in physics, the LED had its day, right? So uh, you can probably see it, but this is just showing the diode, right? The, the light emitting diode. You had red and green for decades, but of course, as you know, it was making the, there was the blue laser, the blue diode, that was the problem. You couldn't do the p-type. Doing a p-type junction was, was very hard. So just doing the p-n junction was very difficult. And as you can see, it was decades uh, between the blue and the green, and, uh, excuse me, between the red and the green and then the blue. And now you have all the three colors and you can create exquisitely any kind of light you wish. You can tailor the light in a way you could never do before, and that is something to measure, and in all sorts of applications. In terms of chemistry, there were uh, folks here, uh, each one with a very colorful story, but super resolution was the issue, right? Where you, normally you could only focus down to a certain spot. This is an example from Stefan Hell, and I, I, I like this example because I use donut modes. I use, I use donut, uh, uh, donut uh, ring, ring uh, laser beams. So he had a vortex where there was nothing in the center and he depleted, uh, he depleted the uh, fluorescence in this area here, leaving just the center to fluoresce. And as you can see, this is without the invention of, uh, this is without super resolution and this is with super resolution. You go from 200 nanometers down to 20 nanometers. An advance in optics and photonics that was un, unheard of, right? This is, this is amazing. Super resolution below the diffraction limit. I don't think I could come here and talk without showing the, the, the rock stars. I don't know which one is John, George, Michael, uh, George, George, Ringo, okay. Um, th th amazing what, what's been done in this. Um, so I'm gonna talk, uh, so now as far as some technical issues, uh, for those of you, you know, I never know if, if uh, somebody is here not, not, not too technical, but the idea of coherence plays such a huge role. Uh, the idea where you take two different waves that are coherent with each other, you interfere them, and where they're in phase, where these waves are in phase, you can add them, constructively add them, and where they're out of phase, you subtract them. And that's a huge deal. Um, and of course, this is just incoherent light, such as you may get it with a, a light bulb or, or, or just noise. Now, what you have with inter interferometry, uh, there's this, it's this beautiful thing here, where if I take a light wave and I split it or have two light waves that are coherent with each other and I combine them, then to a fraction of the wavelength, I could see phase changes. So all I need to do is I can look at a reflection but it, it, or, or I can change one arm if this is an interferometer here, I, all I have to do is change one arm slightly, and I can exquisitely look at any features. And so in this case, over a course of one meter, uh, you can see the difference of five nanometers. So it's a fairly very accurate, uh, very accurate tool. And when I spoke uh, a few years ago at the National Academy's meeting, it's sort of um, 
you know, what are the three, if I had to pick the three things that why optics and photonics really make such a difference in all these applications, one is that high energy can be directed with very low loss. That's, that's for directed energy weapons, for lithography, for optical fibers, low loss, right? That's what we, we know. Many different wave properties exist that can be manipulated. I can do amplitude, amplitude modulation, I could do sensing, I could do encoding of any sort, polarization, qubits, whatever I want. I can do lots of different uh, manipulation pro of these properties. And then these coherent waves have unparalleled accuracy, speed, and dynamic range. You, I mean, you think of these, these optical waves, the frequency is 200 terahertz. So anything you did in, in, in radio is, is terrible in comparison. You have enormous fidelity and it, you can exquisitely change all these properties of this very narrow, very small wavelength. So I want to go through some of the applications. Optical communications, that's my favorite. Uh, and I'll try, to, I'll try to discuss some of them. Okay. Uh, Charlie Cow, you know, he, he is a rock star. Uh, this, uh, unfortunately, Charlie Cow, uh, what his Nobel Prize was for was recognizing that if you had low loss glass, you could make fibers and a communication system. So he'd actually, he didn't make fibers. That was left for the Corning people later to do. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this is his uh, wife. Uh, he suffered from severe Alzheimer's, so he really didn't know what was going on. His wife gave the talk uh, at the Nobel Prize ceremonies. Uh, I was very proud. This was a former student of mine. Uh, that was one of his slides uh, during the talk. What enabled the, the, the really the revolution in terms of capacity over the optical fiber was wavelength division multiplexing. It really was, was a huge thing. And it's no different than people did in the wireless world with radio waves. Frequency multiplexing, that's what you have in the air right now. All these radio stations, right? 100 megahertz, 101 megahertz. Well, you just tune your filter and you have a different radio station. And that's the same thing that happened here. You had all these different lasers at a different color, a different wavelength. They could all be muxed down the optical fiber and your capacity. You could have 80, 160 channels, each at 100 gigabits per second. And you're looking at terabits over one little fiber and you can go over enormous distances. Uh, the nice thing is you could also do networking so that if you just turned on the proper color, you could route all optically uh, from uh, any transmitter to any receiver and just go straight through your, your network. These were major issues. The other major advance, of course, was the er uh, optical fiber amplifier uh, that was invent that was uh, discovered out of the uh, University of Southampton. Uh, you, you, you couldn't, you couldn't predict this, that the loss minimum of the optical fiber uh, would, cor would correspond to the gain maximum of the EDFA. I mean, you, again, it's like magic and it happened. And so with this, you could go across the Pacific Ocean or under the Pacific Ocean and not worry about loss anymore. So distances became almost irrelevant. You, instead of spending a dollar a minute to, call, to make a telephone call across the country, you were spending two cents a minute to call China. Right? And that's because of this. Now, everything about these high-speed data signals uh, is due to the, you know, how these signals go in the glass. And this is the index of refraction. And you care about things like chromatic dispersion, because the index of refraction depends on wavelength. It also depends on power, so there's a nonlinearity. So in terms of metrology, the things you didn't have to measure before, but as the systems get more complex, you have to do more exquisite measurements of the fiber itself and of, the, of what's happening in the system. Just to give you an idea, when you increase the bit rate by two, your problems with chromatic dispersion get worse by a factor of four. So if your bit rate is going up by a factor of 10, things get worse by two orders of magnitude. This creeps up on you very, very rapidly. Now, so I'm going to talk about two issues relating to what you should, what are things important to measure. So in a communication system, I'll talk about phase both in the time domain, but measuring phase also in the spatial domain. First, I'll talk about the time domain. You can take, um, you can take a wave and modulate it. And here you can change the phase of the wave from, uh, by pi. And it goes from a 1 to a 0. Change it again by pi. goes from a 0 to a 1. 
What's beautiful about this is that you're sending energy during the zeros and during the ones. And Shannon tells you that energy is information, and that's capacity. And we really care about spectral efficiency. So for years, right, people thought, you know, in the, in the wireless world, I, I, hear, I hear NIST made a little bit of money off of, yeah. off of the spectrum recently. Okay, that's a good thing. But for years we thought there was infinite bandwidth in fiber. Well, not anymore. We care a lot about spectrum in, in optics. Be and so we really want to have high bits per second per hertz. So let me show you, just as an idea, this, this issue of how many bits of information can you send in one bit time. So in one symbol time, in this case, this would be on-off keying would be a zero here and a one here. If I do phase shift keying where I'm sending, I'm sending power in the one and the zero, it looks like this on the real axis, plus one and really like a minus one because I have mi a minus phase, right? A plus one, minus one. I can do something in quadrature and I can send not just two data points, but I can send four data points. So this is quadrature phase shift keying where I have four different phases. I can go further and I can send, in this case, 16 different amplitude and phase possibilities for my, my carrier wave. Remember, your carrier wave is just a vector. So the vector would have an amplitude and a phase, and I can, I can, I can make this 1,000 quam, and it will be absolutely great, right? Now the problem is, right, this is different phases and amplitudes. I have here, because it's 16 possibilities, I have four bits per second per hertz, or four bits per symbol. Right? I'm fitting more bits in my very precious bandwidth spectrum. Um, but I need to measure things like dispersion and nonlinearity and the phase changes. So with, unless I have a very accurate uh, dispersion and nonlinearity that I know, this just shows you the QPSK, quadrature phase shift king, these four dots, that you get a sort of phase swirl. Things get distorted unless you're really right on. Something to measure. Now, how do you get to more bits per second per hertz? Go to parallel, parallel fibers. But instead of parallel, this is a big, that's a big fiber, actually. This is one fiber and lots of different cores. So multi-core fibers, you literally can send terabits per second in each one of these multi-core fibers. And they got up to. Right, in this case, a petabit per second over 50 kilometers. And, uh, you know, I joined the field in 1988 when they turned on the undersea cable at 280 megabits per second. So it's, it, when I think about a petabit over 50 kilometers, um, it just reminds me, you know, I have my iPhone, but then I have a stack of punch cards in my office for when my first <laughs> undergraduate computer course. You know, that's, we're, we're Moore's Law, it's just a little different. Now, you care about bandwidth. What do you do in the, in the radio world? You have dynamic bandwidth allocation, your cell phones and so on. If you don't use your bandwidth, let somebody else use it. We can't do that yet, unless, uh, in the optics world, unless you do more monitoring and in, uh, and, uh, in, situ, in situ monitoring of what's going on so that you could fill up your spectrum. If, you're, if your channel isn't utilizing the spectrum, then dynamically allocate it, just like you do in the wireless world. So I said that the a optical amplifier, you can go thousands of kilometers, and that was great. But it's funny because, take a step backwards in technology and this active cable is basically making a revolution. This is what's making a, a huge difference in, in data centers. So this is an active cable, right? There are electronics here and here, so you plug into your computer, your server, whatever it is, and it just so happens there's a laser inside, a fiber, and a detector. And as long as you generate a gigabit, 50 gigabits, doesn't matter, you go one meter or 100 meters, it doesn't matter. So it, sh it literally doesn't matter whether your server is next door or across the room or across the building. Huge improvement in terms of the ability to process data. So you know, I think, right, you know uh, spectrum is important. Time is very important. I hear you, you know about time, right? You know about time. 
So let's, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to do the numbers. So this was, uh, this came out a few months ago, in December. So normally you go from Singapore to the UK, okay? Normally you just go to the US, go across the US and go to the UK. They spent $850 million to build a fiber route this way through the Northwest Passage. Why? To save 24 milliseconds. Because the way people do trading on the stock market, that's real money. So, so that's, you know, they, when you think about it, that's like, you know, $10 million per millisecond, roughly. Okay, that money, that, that number will only increase. But that shows you that time is of incredible value and how to, and how to uh, really make use of it. Now, silicon, it's funny, again, for years people thought silicon was not a good, uh, a good material for photonics. But people made, I won't go through the names, but wonderful advances in silicon photonics. And silicon is great because we have all this manufacturing capability to, to process it so cheaply. And so this is just from Intel, this sort of this cable here, this active cable where you have 50 gigabits per second, just a bunch of lasers, modulators, detectors, uh, all just integrated in a package, really cheap, and makes a huge, huge impact. What about the future? You can do lots of things with it. This is like a, 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 just a cartoon diagram. All these different photonic circuits you could build on a, on a chip and the integrated, uh, the, in, the manufacturing institute may be facilitating that. Uh, and then the power consumption on here becomes an issue as they start moving, this is from, from, uh, <coughs> from Intel, down to uh, femtojoules per bit. That's the hope. I can't come to NIST without showing this. So um, I think you guys probably take the cake <laughs> with, in terms of orders of magnitude uh, all the time. And I, it, it's, it's truly amazing that you have 10 to the minus 18-ish uh, accuracies on clocks. You can make attoseconds. Um, it's fun, it, you, I, you can't get your head around it. But what this kind of accuracy can do I, I am a systems person. I can, you have, just like the Erbium amplifier freed me in terms of distance, you've allowed, with this kind of accuracy, I can build networks. I can build processing systems where th things that are, uh, entities that are kilometers apart, because they can now act coherently, they have, again, exquisite timing, they can literally act as if they were one thing. And the, the idea of designing in that space is only now beginning. So it's, it's, there's a lot of fun. And again, it's coming out from this, the chip-based versions of the clocks and so on. I, I, I think, uh, what was it? The, there's one second error in 13 billion years or something? So God's clock is still accurate, I think. 13 billion, whatever, okay. Now, quantum is a big deal. And many of you work on quantum. But quantum is, you know, the, I work on, I, I'm, I'm working on quantum. How do you make, and you can do lots of things with it. You can do communications, you can do metrology, uh, computing, sensing, wonderful things. How do you generate one photon? How do you detect one photon? And, you know, not only, you know, if you can bring something to market, but how do you even measure that? that, that that's tough. And, again, until those things become clear, it's going to be hard to envision systems being embraced. So metrology becomes very important on the single photon level. The National Academy's report, we, we talked about making advances in quantum because if you can treat one photon the same way we talk about manipulating one electron, it opens up unheard of applications and unheard of, unheard of capabilities. Can you work with a photon the way the electron was worked on in the 20th century? And again, that's, it, it, we don't know. I mean, what did they tell me to, to, to generate one photon? Oh, just, 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 just put a, an attenuator. I was like, that's not gonna work <laughs> in, in the real world. Okay, so um, let's move on to energy and lighting. Wanna, it's very funny. This idea of the LEDs, uh, solid state lighting making a big deal. 
uh, here's this dress that nobody can agree on. And then they did a, they did a, uh, you know, they try to look at the, the color distribution, different points here, and they found, of course, that there was a, a difference of the color and what really the color was. The point is, is with LEDs, you have monochromatic light and mixing in different ways, you can create whatever you want. And it opens up all sorts of fun things. So here's just one slide. It, it, I, I'm just projecting. This came out, I think it was last week, in the, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It showed that if you're, <laughs> OK, you have a body clock, right? We all know that, the morning, evening, that if you're exposed to light, or at least if mice are, uh, more hours of the day, you become more obese. So. Maybe, it's cert maybe there's a way to tailor the light so that you can lessen this issue in humans. Not clear. But we have the ability now to do it that we didn't have before. Now, um, medical applications. Uh, just, to let, just to see, this is uh, some of the work of, that was by Betzek that just shows, the, again, the non-super resolution and the super resolution. But I want to go through, of course, uh, optical coherence tomography. Um, I went to the, I went to the uh, eye doctor, I got this thing, and I was asking all these questions. I think I was driving the person crazy. Um, anyway, of course, you're looking at uh, some spot, and light can go through tissue, and, and you can reflect, and then it's an interferometer, right? You can look at wonderful things. This shows you on the uh, top is uh, surgery without uh, optical coherence tomography. And this is surgery with it, and the ability to really have very well-defined surgical uh, boundaries. Uh, in terms of imaging, uh, this is the pill cam. I've never had to swallow one. But this is just, again, opti optics. And as it goes through your esophagus and through your stomach, it's taking a picture. In a way, it's just the beginning. It's kind of like you know, the black and white televisions for, you know, from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Right? It's just the beginning. This pill cam is making really a revolution. In, but the capabilities aren't that great yet. Um, this is uh, a CT scan. This is from Tom Baer. Uh, just showing you, again, this wonderful image uh, of a CT scan. But in terms of metrology, there really is a problem. And you know, you take a picture. Everybody's body is different. I'm not, that's not a judgment call. <laughs> Everybody's to the tissue, the body, the what, what, you know, you talk about optical fiber, the, the uh, dispersion, or, you know, the, the index of refraction. My index of refraction is different than everybody else's in this room. How do you quantify all this medical imaging so that you go in and there really is something that a doctor, numbers that come out. You know, you take, you, you measure, doctors, you know, you measure the, your cholesterol and other, can you do something where all of this means something beyond just a more, a better picture for a doctor to examine? But real numbers, and this is a great area that is unfolding. How do you standardize medical imaging for a person? And every person is different. Um, now for laser, lasers are great. Uh, high power lasers are great. I want to show you this. This is just a, a, a video. Watch this. Um, you know, I love. I, I think I quoted Star Trek before. Here's a. Here's a. a, a fi this is a fiber laser. A fiber laser that was dismissed a decade ago as it won't have enough power. But that was before these large area fibers came out. And this guy is just using a, a handheld phaser. <laughs> to cut through this. Look, look at this. And you know, this, is the, this is a fiber laser. And it's growing, again, with these orders of magnitude increases in power. Wait another decade. This thing is going, these fiber lasers are really going to transform directed energy. Anyway, it's going to cut through in just a second. Anyway, <laughs> you wouldn't want to stand on the other side of that. <laughs> anyway. I think all the phasers in Star Trek, you could see the light. Uh, this, this you can't see. I don't think they invented erbium. In there. Um, so back in 1988, I was offered a postdoc. Uh, one postdoc was in fiber optic communications. One was in uh, x-ray lithography. So in 1988, I was told, optical lithography is coming to an end. Go into x-ray lithography. I didn't. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, uh, and not for any good reason. I just happened to go into optical communications. But it's amazing that Moore's law is still by optics, right? There's somehow we're squeezing out innovation from this field to keep us on Moore's law. And even though people say, you know, we're coming to the end, mm, I've heard that before, but maybe optics will play a role in whatever, whatever it turns into anyway. And just to give you an idea, the, uh, this, is, this shows you some of the uh, errors that you, ha you have to be within this error less than, a, if, you, if Moore's law continues, you have to be on the order of like a nanometer of accuracy. Really tough to do. Um, let me just mention, uh, uh, again, I'll, with my uh, few minutes left, if we started at five after, do I go to five after? Or, or? You have to end five minutes early. Oh, okay. So, Laser welding is an amazing thing because, again, you have exquisite control over the beam. And you can measure the beam. It's almost like it's its, it's, its own probe beam. As opposed to an arc welding, where you don't really know what's going on, you now can, contr you can control what kind of a beam is there and what it's being used for and measure it in situ. And I'll just show you this. This is, a, um, just this is just showing you, if you just change the intensity profile, whether it be a flat top or a, or, or a, uh, a you know, like a sinusoid or, a, or an invert, an M, it would give you, this is this inverted M, it gives you a better, a better cut, right, a better weld. And this is about tailoring the light, controlling the light, measuring the light, measuring the weld as it's being made. And you can do that. Now this is, um, this is a jet engine and you're looking, you can measure all sorts of things in terms of stresses using optics, that's great. You've probably seen this, right? And the, the Economist, it was on the cover of The Economist, uh, print me a Stradivarius. This is 3D printing. But it really is a lot of fun just to see this. this you can just see, it, this is optics. So it lays a film, and then the, the optical, is, it's just going to create something. You can create something with la lasers can go where machine tools can't. You can create things very rapidly and in a way that you couldn't do before. Uh, and again, now it's just gonna speed up. But this is gonna create a, an engine part, okay? And Jeff Imelt from the CEO of GE said a couple years ago, this cut can cut down the development time of engines by 50%. That's a big deal. So uh, with that, I'm gonna just mention, uh, I'm gonna go to free space optics and I'll, and I'll finish. So, Fiber is great. Free space optics has all sorts of fun things. You know, you, in, in, this, in, in, um, in outer space, you care about size, weight, and power. And in theory, optics should be great with that because it, right, power consumption doesn't increase much as you go to higher, higher speeds. And you can control the beam. So all sorts of things, even undersea uh, communications by optics. I want to show you just, this is my own personal. This is my work, okay? But it's kind of fun. It shows you, again, the idea that there are, innovations are happening all the time. You cannot stand still for a decade. In 1992, which was, I consider to be yesterday, in 1992, Les Allen in the UK discovered that if you have a helical phase, basically a donut mode, a donut ring, where there's a vortex in the center and there's a twisting of the phase front of the wave, that can carry orbital angular momentum, 1992. And that was just a paper. And so the idea of the applications of this, it's only just beginning. So I'll show you one application. So this is where you have a phase, uh, this is just a, a, a plane wave with uh, it's a Gaussian beam in intensity in the center and the phase doesn't change. If you, t if you twist the light and it's slowly twisting, that would be this one here and it's a donut. With nothing in the center, and then a two pi phase change. But I can twist faster, and then I can twist even faster. Just like a Fourier series, cosine omega t plus cosine two omega t plus cosine three omega t, all of those in a Fourier series are orthogonal to each other. They don't interact. So if I were to put data on this beam and data on this beam, they would be orthogonal. And I can mux them together, transmit them over the same, the same space, and then demultiplex them. And I can increase my capacity. And this is 
work that came out. Again, if you have free space communications here, different twistings of the light. And when, by the way, you get a factor of two for free because you can twist clockwise and you can twist counterclockwise and they're orthogonal as well. So I can do it on two polarizations as you see here. This is those beautiful, these are these, these beautiful interferograms. This is the phase front where you take a Gaussian and interfere it with an, an orbital angular momentum beam. So this is with a, an OAM value of 4, 8, minus 8, 16. And if you really want to know what's going on, just like you want to know the frequency or the, fa uh, the frequency of, 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 of a radio wave, which you do, I want to know the phase front. I want to know how phase is changing in the spatial domain. And just to give you an idea, this just shows you that if, this, if my OAM beam is messed up, that's because power has been pushed into other modes, into other angular momentum modes. So this is an interesting issue. So with that, I'm gonna, just going to mention we did some wonderful collaborative work with, uh, with NIST in Boulder on doing um, monitoring, uh, performance monitoring uh, in optical networks, which is a big deal because right now what people do is they still measure things in the field, they make it in the factory, they tweak it when they deploy it, and then they pray that nothing changes. And uh, just to, this is a simple example. But again, something we did and we collaborated with, with the folks in Nixon, Nist and Boulder. Here's an interferometer. An interferometer does what? There's coherence. The, the, signal is, the signal is coherent, the noise is not coherent. So an interferometer doesn't do anything to noise, but it does have constructive and destructive interference for the signal. So I can just take a simple ratio and I can find out what the signal to noise ratio is and it's independent of bit rate, it's independent of modulation format, it's just something you can make on a chip and we, we also uh, te field tested it in Google Labs as well and it was really quite, quite an, a lovely thing. Um, this is just a fun slide if, if I get invited back in another 18 years. Metamaterials, my son, my, one of my sons loves Harry Potter. Metamaterials, this, the, again, this is metrology on this. Don't wait 10 years, of course, and I know many of you are working on this as well. I'll end with this. This, just like the semiconductor industry, the op optical communications has gone orders of magnitude over the last few decades. So this is bit rate distance versus year, and every few years is another technology whether it be uh, different fibers, the optical amplifier, wavelength multiplexing, space multiplexing, all these wonderful things. I joined the field here and somebody said to me, who was very knowledgeable, why are you joining optical fiber communications? It's a mature field without much growth left. And the party has really only begun. Thank you very much. Well, hopefully we'll have time for a couple of questions. Um, might start with Boulder since uh, they got a lot of air time here. I can't, uh, no, I guess not. So, question. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation, really wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, when you want to know the structure of something, often you do a scattering and you have to solve the inverse scattering problem and phase can be a problem. Now, you can use wavelength tunability to try to beat that. Can you also use your, the chirality of your light waves to get more information when you scatter from a system? Excellent question. Uh, I don't have to repeat it because everybody here has a microphone. Uh, yeah. That's an excellent question. Um, so b basically, the, the phase, the phase front becomes another dimension. Whether it, so you, spectroscopy uses the wavelength and you could use polarization issues. Well, now you can use this orbital angular momentum, the phase. So if you send something in as a probe and it scatters to other modes, that's a signature. And so you can use it as a sensor. We, and I, I didn't show it, but we, uh, we published where you, uh, you can actually use an inverse function at the receiver, both as an adaptive optics approach to undo, almost like, right, just an inverse, an infer, inverse transfer function. Uh, we can also do it in the electronic domain, right? Because you, again, you have so much information. You also can get information from different modes, because each mode, is, by the way, each mode, I don't know if anybody noticed, 
the modes grew as you had a higher order number. As more twisting, it grew. So just like in spectrum, you have a limited, you can't have infinite number of, of data channels because you have limited spectrum. You have a limited aperture size, right? But absolutely, you, it, this, the phase front is like it's a sensor. Okay, so, um, oh, Jerry. Go ahead. Uh, just one quick question. Anyway, Alan, I enjoyed your talk. Um, on the need to keep up with capacity for networks, it was highlighted in the NRC report. Are we on schedule or are we uh, having, coming up against some risk we won't be able to keep up with demand? So, uh, uh, excellent question as well. When you, when you, so your, your question is a great one because are, are we on track? Well, <clears throat> The research community, so over the last few decades, things that appeared in the, in the laboratory about five to seven years later appeared in products, which is a great kind of an industry. A lot of the work recently has been on these multi-core multi fibers or multi-mode fibers. Um, that's sort of leading the, the capacity in the research area. It's not clear whether that's going to really appear because that's a new kind of fiber. Will you, we have a billion kilometers of fiber in the ground. There are no multi, I mean, there's no ecosystem with, so you, even if you have this wonderful multi-core fiber, where are the multi-core amplifiers? Where are the multi-core uh, couplers and connectors and you know, all the other wavelength multiplexers? So it's not clear that that's gonna be implemented anytime soon mm -hmm. and have a big impact. So, we may, we may be in our field where the research is still going forward, but it's not clear that it's going to meet the capacity crunch that, that's going, that, that, we, that, of course, we all expect now. All right, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you for a wonderful and exciting talk. Um, I gather we've got you for about another hour. Yeah. Um, so as people uh, move out and look at the posters, they might come up and ask you some questions. Hopefully you, you'll continue to answer sure. questions. Um, and again, let's thank you for a great, great, exciting talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>